categories. So with that done, I, did, I said everybody, I'd do a commercial for them all. Um, if I did anything really horrible, correct me. Um, otherwise, as, you, as Alex set this thing up, you know, the, what was once, you know, retail used to be retail, marketing was over here, everybody was in their own little boxes, and now, thanks to the fabulous internet, we have these huge chains of everything connecting. And so I wanted to just start out by asking everybody, maybe we'll start with Howard, you know, we are supposed to be talking about e-commerce here, even though everybody in this room does other things as well. How does you, what you do, how do you see that chain, and how does, what, what where do you plug into it, and what, what needs do you fill, I guess would be the simple way. Well, Yex starts at the very beginning, sort of, of the chain in a lot of ways. So our customers take a Citibank or FedEx. You know, when you look up, like, a Dropbox for FedEx, you want to make sure that you get the last pickup time right when you look that up online. And so in, in that way, we sort of touch the end user at the exact moment of, of local search since our software makes it possible for a, a brand like FedEx to update their location data across platforms. Um, and since half of local searches are mobile, and actually half of mobile searches are local too. Is that a Google, that's, that's a Google, a Google, Google. stat. That's a Google stat. You know, we're, we're right there for, for 250,000 locations whenever you conduct a local search, which is actually a, a, a hugely commercially driven, driven type of uh, action. So you're all in the cloud, everything. That's right. And so your customers are enterprises, typically. Enterprises and tens of thousands of SMBs that put their location data into our software, and then it updates across you know, 50 different platforms immediately. So if they change a phone number or put up a picture or even put a social post up of a particular location, that information then makes it up into Facebook and Foursquare and Google and Yahoo and Bing, et cetera. So what's product development for you? What, what would be a typical thing that you'd add to that? Well, what's, what's coming? What's something new you're going to have in the next oh, month? Well, we have a lot of different things coming up. We, we actually recently launched a, a feature called Pages uh, that enables the, the, the same enterprise to take that content that's in our cloud and then publish that across uh, their own store pages, the store locator, so that when you go mm -hmm. to type in the thing directly on FedEx.com or Citibank.com, the content in there could also be coming from our cloud as well, and they're okay. owned and operated stuff, in addition to the search media that we're able to get them. Got to. it. Okay, let me jump to Alex. I mean, now you're, you're looking... You're looking at granular, at, at cut people as, as individuals, right? Yes, it, 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 absolutely. I mean, from our point of view, um, there's going to be a very big shift that will eventually occur to the point that it'll be users that end up being in control as opposed to commerce being in control. Um, we, we heard the, the, the uh, Amazon being referred to in your opening remarks. Yeah. If you, um, the stats are apparently around 40% of their sales are made through the people like you also buy. An incredible uh -huh. stuff. Now, just think about Amazon for a moment, and what does Amazon know about you? What Amazon knows about you is what you've done on Amazon. Well, think about the idea of you being able to share, make a decision as to how much of you you want to share with Amazon that goes beyond your behavior. Think about who you are, how introvert you are, how extrovert, how conscientious, how impulsive. So in, All of in, these in, in your site, people actually go to a website and fill things out, or people do. Yeah, um, we've we've created an interface to make it incredibly easy. So um, you you do that through images. We ask people very simple questions, and they respond with images. Like which picture would you have? Like which picture do you like? Or well, it's it's uh, so. For instance, it may be like, what does freedom mean to you? Mm -hmm. um, now it's quite a difficult thing to describe with words. Um, you can put a pile of cash. Someone standing on top of a mountain. Um, uh, someone tearing up a marriage certificate, all sorts of different things that might symbolize freedom. Now, how, do, how does that convert into something that's useful to a bank or a store? Essentially, it's about going beyond demographics. It's about being able to say the who of you uh, actually is the thing that then leads to the what you do. So we're going that stage beyond not just looking at what someone does, we're looking at what the motivation is, the why, if you like. And we're able to pass that through in real time uh, through our API to all sorts of different do you, partners. Do, do you cross that with more classical information about what people, about their behavior? We or? do, we do. And we're, we, I mean, with our e-commerce e partners, we're looking at the actual things that people are buying and then being able to be essentially providing predictive analytics based on this type of person is more likely to buy that. Not only buy that, but what time of day are they going to come and buy that? What day of the week are they going to buy that? Okay, Tanya, now you're looking at people's social activities. Is that right? I mean, so how does, how does that 
fit with what he just described? Sure. So Shareably measures the world's interactions with brands. So if you think about it, social media is really just another form of word of mouth. It's just tracked digitally. Um, so it's really about helping retailers or you know, companies like Amazon understand how much real estate they own in the mind of the customer. And of how a, particular, likely... a particular individual, it's, it's, it's at the level of... Correct, so it, it goes all the way down to a user level, although typically it's way too much information to consume. So typically like our, our information is consumed in the aggregate to understand, you know, are Amazon's customers more likely to recommend Amazon to their friends than, you know, potentially a competitor? And if so, what kinds of content is actually fueling that sort of positive recommendations. Because you know, a year ago, if you think about it, retailers across social media were trying to use it like a magical vending machine. It was all like shop now and click here. And now it's much more branding. And it's much more about trying to own the whole customer consciousness and the experience. And then occasionally sort of slipping in, oh, by the way, you know, here's a thing that you could buy from us that that could also enhance your life, but it really isn't the, the way that brands lead anymore. Now, so let me slip into a little jargon. Is this used in real time or is this for insights about customers? I mean... Sure, so it's it can be used in real time, but it's typically used more to understand your competitive positioning in the marketplace, what's working, what's not, so you can continue adjusting, but it's not used, for instance, to optimize real time purchase. That's a very different type of business. Okay. Um, now, we'll, now we're, I mean, your you're mail's in the situation, you have a highly integrated, you got the whole chain here. How do you, how do you look at that? Do you, do you see that, do you see it as a vertically integrated stack? Where do you see, are you expanding horizontally? What, how do you see the whole thing, I mean, from, from, from that perspective? Um. I mean, basically, Ozone, as you mentioned, is very much integrated. So we are a typical e-commerce. We have an e-commerce business, but we also have a delivery system. We also have a GSI e-commerce type of business. We also have a travel business. So we really, we're, we're the biggest e-commerce platform. And clearly, the question you ask is basically the question we ask ourselves pretty much every three or four months about there is this new technology in the market, there is this uh, new features, there is this new thing that we would like to do. Do we do it ourselves, or do we actually come to one of these companies and say, can you do it for us? And I think for a lot of e-commerce players at the moment, this is, this is really a tricky question. And it comes down to what is really your core business if you're an e-commerce? Is it really the act of selling? Or is it everything that is around? And then the next question, which is the one your shareholders usually ask them, I haven't seen mine in the room yet, but I know they're here somewhere, uh, is, but where are we gonna make the most money? Is it in the core business, so again, the, the act of selling to the customer, or is that all the service around? And if you think about it, Amazon is making, apparently they don't disclose many numbers, but they seem to make most of their business on everything around. The merchant platform, the service to third parties, et cetera, et cetera, rather than the pure direct sales um, direct sales business. And so when you start talking about all these companies, there is always in your mind something about, do I really want to give that that chunk of business? Because maybe that's where I should make most of my money. Um, I mean, the data thing is fascinating to me. I mean, obviously transactions people, you know, Amazon famously knows exactly what you've bought. They know what's in your cart. They know what's on your wish list. They know lots and lots of stuff. I, also, obviously, in the last year or so, the issue of who owns data, privacy, all those kind of things. How much does that, in, like, for instance, in the Soviet, in, in not Soviet, sorry, sorry, in Russia today, uh, how is that? Is that a? Do people care? Do your customers care? Are they on your case about it or? Um, so first, the first thing to know is that Russian consumers are are uh, among the biggest users of social network in the world. Uh, if not the biggest, I think I saw a statistic saying that the only people who use social network more than them are the Israeli. Yeah, and you also have among the heaviest frequency of actions. Yeah, exactly, just, exactly. So in Russia, in Russia, they have uh, three big social network, including Facebook. But Facebook is actually not the biggest one. So they, by by uh, habit, Russian people actually already use quite a lot of um, quite a lot of the social network and share a lot of data. Um, do you guys look at that? Do you do? You, yes, we do. We are actually. How do you, how do, you do it? Uh, I mean, first we active as a as a brand. We just 
do things. We interact with our customer. We don't use social network as a way to sell. We use social network as a way to uh, respond to customer inquiries to build a brand, basically what you mentioned. And by the way, oh, we're doing a promotion, but that's like, you know, if, if you have nothing else to do apart from reading our amazingly interesting tweets, you can also buy on our website. But to come back to your question about data sharing, so first, the first element is that Russian are used to share a lot of data through social network. But on the other hand, they don't really trust the banking system and don't really trust uh, the brands. And because of that, there has been historically... Does that include you? Do they trust Ozone? They trust us to a certain extent, but I think in general, the Russian consumers are very careful uh, with anybody they deal with. And the way people like us deal with this is we do cash on delivery, which means that you don't have to leave us a credit card. You don't even have to leave us uh, any type of identification. You can actually make a purchase on our website by uh, making up an email address and a login uh, password, and then you can change it every time. That's good for the consumer trust. That's really bad, as you can imagine, for data analytics. Wow. But from my point of view, there's, uh, there's a, an inevitability about the shift that's going to occur. And that, that shift is, the inevitability is towards the consumer owning ultimately everything. And, uh, you know, we, we've, we, we can see the various different layers of it. Um, on, on one level, there's this almost sub-ecosystem that's been developed around compliance and privacy. But... The, the ultimate motivation has got to be about getting true balance into the ecosystem. And at the, at the moment, there is not balance. I mean, the user ultimately ends up being treated much more like a number than a, than a, than a person. And, and from my point of view, whether it's two years, three years, five years, ten years, eventually users will be the people that are actually at the center uh, pulling things towards them rather than having things pushed towards them. Well, do you think, I mean, is this, I mean, uh, you know, Ozone, for instance, is probably big enough that you could do, you could gather, you could have an entire department, you probably do, a data department that does nothing but sift through and bring in third party and et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, you guys are each, you two here in the middle are each taking pieces of a puzzle that might be incorporated into some larger thing. I mean, are, do you expect to grow, like for instance, Tanya, you know, you, you're doing social stuff, obviously you could add, you could buy in some other data, you could buy in credit card data and match it with your stuff and start, is that the way you would look at things or do you keep these, you're just going to focus on what you're doing? Sure. So th there's a couple of answers to that. So, I mean, we do take in customer data where available. Most retailers, however, you can pry their sales data out of their cold dead hands. I mean, they're not going to give it to another third party, so that's very rare. You can absolutely, I mean, my background, I used to work for a company called Comscore, so they had a panel and you would actually see credit card um, interactions, obviously privacy protected. But to me, uh, viewing a medium like social as a click to commerce platform is really the wrong way to look at it because it happens at the point where people are researching a product, it happens at the point where they're understanding what their friends are buying, where they're deciding if they're going to buy at all and if they're going to trust something at all. So, you know, every time you have a, a new technology or a new way of communicating with customers, people try and translate it inevitably straight away to a direct response vehicle. And there are direct response components to it, but it's really, you know, measuring straight clicks or measuring straight, you know, trying to tie your Facebook post to uh, one specific transaction on Amazon is going to miss all of the things that happen between the point where I decide which retailer to go. And, you know, there's so much data at the customer's fingertips. They have so much choice, both from a pricing as well as a variety standpoint, that it's really just, you know, I come back to that, that concept of owning real estate in the customer's mind, of being the top choice for a specific product. And that's, that's much harder to quantify from a direct clicks perspective. Um, Howard, you, you, obviously you mentioned mobile as a big deal. Um, yeah. How do you, I want it just everybody right across the line, how do you see, I mean, the, where are we in the evolution of mobile commerce? I mean, there's lots of funny pieces. The location piece is an interesting one. There's many, many pieces. Yep. Where, where would you see us in that trajectory? So we've been talking about e-commerce, and, you know, my view is that, that sort of the world of commerce is fundamentally divided into stuff that comes to you and stuff that you kind of go out and buy. 
and those are sort of converging, and Uber is maybe the best example of that. Um, and so, you know, you basically are in a certain area, and you want a car, and then on demand, it, it appears. In order to, to get that car, think about the stack that has to come together. You have basically Google Maps, and you have this on-demand sort of driver network that's happening. Then you put your credit card into their software in a, in a sort of super easy, um, frictionless way that makes payments super easy. And then you have a frictionless payment experience at the end. In order to enjoy that experience, you really have to give up a lot of data about you. To, to make that amazing, right. for example, where you are right now. Um, and so in order to have that on-demand kind of thing, you're going to have to do that. To enjoy Seamless, you're going to have to, which is a sort of New York-based thing where you can order anything online and have the food show up to you right away, you have to tell it what you want to eat. Um, and in return for such data, you get exactly what you want to eat. Um, and so that's, that, that, I think, is sort of the, the, the fundamental thing in that you, know, you have stuff that comes to you, stuff that you, you may want to buy, and, and mobile is just sort of another platform that's particularly anchored around location that's going to enable that. And then, of course, you tie that to the payments. You're able to do frictionless type payments um, with stuff like Uber. Um, Tanya, I mean, social, the intersection of social and mobile is kind of odd. Where, where do you see that? Do you see people, is that, you know, the, the idea, the everybody's favorite idea that, oh, my friend, your, somebody's friend is going to tell them, oh, I just ate a great pizza from X place. Is that, is, is that really playing out in the real world? Sure. I mean, so much social interactions come from mobile devices. I, I want to pick up. I love Seamless. I come home. I leave the office late. I'm in a cab. I click a couple buttons. By the time I get home, there is this little guy with a bag with the food that I want. I don't even have to tip him because I've already tipped him. It's kind of amazing. Um, so absolutely, I think facilitating those kinds of almost lifestyle-based interactions um, is huge. You know, and I think it's only going to continue to be that way. I mean, still there are so many transactions that are just hard to execute. You know, and I love that concept of it being frictionless. Um, seamless is frictionless, but most you've got to go through all these screens and then you're like, you know, screw it, but it's just going to be easier for me to go home, fire up my computer and handle it there. Um, but we definitely see a huge migration towards mobile. Uh, we see a lot of uh, people um, interacting even with... Um, I guess what you call them, bricks and mortar retailers. Um, that sort of sounds like an anachronistic term, but we see the, those kinds of interactions happening in store. Not the purchase, but the research of what's going in. So you have these very informed consumers, but eventually there's no reason why the whole transaction couldn't happen in that flow. It's just that oftentimes the inventory for some of the bigger guys just isn't tied into that experience and it, it becomes hard. I will add that iBeacon is a new sort of thing that's going to start to enable that so very that quickly. Increasingly, yeah. we're seeing that uh, adopted by even Macy's has recently ruled that out. Quickly, in what iBeacon is? iBeacon is a low energy Bluetooth protocol that Apple has set forth that allows uh, the transmission of this sort of uh, low energy Bluetooth signal that can wake up an app on your phone. Right, and it lasts forever, like it lasts for two years. So yeah. a, a little Oreo years. hardware. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Alex. I mean, part of the implication I think of what your guys are doing is that you could know or in what somebody wants to buy yes. before they yeah absolutely they buy it. so uh, so uh, you know from our point of view the you know we talked about trust and you know the whole thing of trust is going to be you know such an important part or already is uh, from our point of view the brands of the future that people will trust <clears throat> will actually be the tribes of people like them so social obviously defines a, a group of people that are connected in a certain way i think there'll be much more transparency of finding virtually people that are like you. So people that are like you that have got a similar taste to you in fashion. People that like the same books as you. These people will actually be in separate groups. They're not necessarily going to be some homogenized Well, how, But how is that different from traditional marketing where they would just you know, say, oh, the bucket of we're going to go after 18 to 24 uh, well, well, males? Well, the, dif the difference is, uh, it's a really great question. The difference is that you had no idea what bucket you were being placed in uh, through mobile and through all of the connectivity that's happening, you, you will get to be the person that decides how to define who you are and therefore be able to be matched up to people like you. And we, we absolutely see a, a, a space before too long where if you think of Pinterest, Pinterest relies on people pinning things in order for people then to go and see things. Well, imagine a place where you're actually seeing the interactions of people like you in real time 
what it is they're reading, what it is they're watching, what it is that they're buying. These sorts of things, and being able to group people according to like-mindedness, that type of thing will happen, and I believe it will be those groups that then become the brands of the future, the brands that you end up trusting. So the, the providers of, of, of the services in order to make those things happen uh, will all be about the seamless way of connecting with those, uh, those things and those people. And if I could add, I mean, one thing that I see a lot of and I think that excites me about a lot of companies doing innovative things in segmentation is that ultimately segmentation has to be behaviour or values based. You know, a lot of the traditional segments of, you know, you're a 25 to 34 year old female, um, you're professional, therefore you're going to like X, Y and Z. It's correct, you know, maybe 30 to 40% of the time, but it misses, you know, uh, you buy a Burberry purse and you're a luxury purchaser, but maybe you're not a luxury purchaser for automobiles because you value green tech or whatever it is. And I think when you start taking into account the value of the individual based on how they act and how they show up in the world as opposed to what they say they are, which, you know, there's, you know, there's huge amounts of information documenting that anything you, you know, people who say they're more likely to purchase don't necessarily purchase. You want to sort of see what they do when, when they vote with their feet. So I think there's huge opportunities to continue to get smarter about the consumer and, and to watch people's own behaviour self-identify them. Um, Mail, as, as somebody who's operating across, you know, mobile is, is one way that you presumably sell things. There, you have lots of multi-channel, multi I guess omni-channel would be the best word. What can you say about how your mobile business is evolving right now and how it's, is it differentiating from the classic desktop web-based? I think, unfortunately, I need to differentiate the way e-commerce deal with mobile and the way we deal with mobile, mm -hmm. just because Russia, despite having a very high penetration of mobile devices, um, is not necessarily the best place at the moment to do mobile shopping. Uh -huh. The connections are not very good. Even in Moscow, I would, I would never do uh, online shopping on my mobile unless I'm on a Wi-Fi connection, uh, because the 3G, 4G, I'm sure sometimes 5G at some point, they're not good enough. So it's, it's not, it's not, uh, it doesn't give you the great user experience. The second thing is if you look at the penetration of smartphone with screens which are large enough to actually do online shopping, uh, it's actually much smaller than we would think um, because in Russia, the uh, mobile operator do not subsidize the, the handset. So you have to, pull the full, the, to put the full price on the table, which is really expensive. But this being said, if you ignore us <laughs> and you think about e-commerce, I mean, mobile is definitely one of the things that is uh, changing, it's not, it, which is changing e-commerce experience, is not the only thing. I think there is an ecosystem which is being created. When you think about it, again, talking about Amazon, maybe they had this, um, this idea straight from the beginning, or maybe not, but if you look at it now, they have created an ecosystem where you have the one-click payment, which they have patented. Uh, they have the Amazon Prime, which allows you to not really care about, you need to bundle the orders, you need to put three things, one thing. No, you just you just find something you like, you just click, and even if it's a toothbrush, it's going to be delivered tomorrow. And then you got the mobile application, which is extremely convenient, and all of that all work together. Then you have emails and uh, recommendation algorithm, just in case you don't know what to buy, they're actually going to show it to show it to you and all of that creates an ecosystem where the mobile device is just one element in this ecosystem what does amazon do that you most envy what's the what's the thing that they everything <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think I think they've done. They they have been the pioneer in this industry. I think they've created. Uh, I'm going to use this word again, but I think they've created this amazing ecosystem. I know basically only one other company in e-commerce, which I think has an amazing ecosystem. It's Rakuten. Uh, Rakuten mm -hmm. is one of our shareholders, and and we actually went to see them to for them to become shareholders precisely because we wanted to understand the way they now they Rakuten is, is 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 known. They they do a lot of sort of third party. 
Yes, they started like that, but then then they created a bank. So there is Rakuten Bank, and then there is Rakuten Travel, and then there is uh, Rakuten. I think they even have a dating agency or a waiting agency. It I sounds mean, like you're going that way a little bit too. Uh, yeah, I think the waiting agency again. My shareholders not. I don't know if they're in the room, but I doubt very much they're going to allow me to do that. But uh, I think e-commerce. We're back to the question of e-commerce um, becomes part of your environment, and it can't be just one little thing. You need all the services services that go around the direct sales service so that you get a smooth experience and, and shopping becomes something you do the same way you breathe. By the way, it's, it's exciting, but it's also scary because when I hear the comments about how much data can be collected and supposedly that as a, cust a customer you can uh, change your profile, I'm sorry, I disagree with that. I think the most scary part is that there's so much data being collected on all of us, not by the NSA. I mean, I'm actually much more scared by the companies collecting so much data on all of us. Uh, and so what are you going to do about that? I mean, you're the CEO of one of those companies. Look, as a, as a business person, what you try to do is obviously you benefit from this trend. So saying, "Oh no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that." Uh, we're we're not a non-profit, you know. We we're here to we're here to make a business. I think what you need to do as a as a company is first to be super clear, like extremely clear about what you do with the data. Transparent. Transparent, yeah. You need to inform your customer before you make any change. And I think there have been many, many occasions in the, in the past year where a lot of company got caught by the fact that they were changing privacy policies without informing customer. And that's a major issue. And you should always Again, it's very much my personal opinion, but you should always allow customers to have a say in that. They, they should have the opportunity to agree or not agree. And unfortunately, this is not happening. A lot of, I'm going to talk about e-commerce, but it's, it's the case for pretty much all the companies that collect data around us. They use our data for profit reasons, and they never, ever answer uh, about what they do with this data and yeah. the fact that they can change their privacy policy the way they want. Okay, let me, you, you I want to ask, we've got three minutes left. Um, let's quickly, from your points of view as participants in the overall e-commerce set, how do you see the balance between small entities and large ecosystems of the sort that, that Mail is involved with, or Amazon? In other words, can small businesses survive in the coming, or are we going to be in the land of giants and everybody has to pick a team? I think it's going to depend on the vertical, like everything. You're going to see stuff like Uber, you're going to see stuff like Seamless, you're going to still see a local veterinarian, you're still going to see a local physician, a hospital, you're going to see governments, you're going to see just a fragmented ecosystem where there's verticals that are dominant and horizontals that are dominant. Okay. Tanya? Sure. I would say that there is always going to be opportunity to improve. There's always going to be ways to market a better product or make something you know, more frictionless or better available. So I believe that there's an ecosystem where both can exist. Okay. Alex? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and I, I actually think that the world... Uh, for, for, for all of us as, as consumers is just going to get more and more exciting. Uh, the, 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 the discovery that's going to open up uh, for us, the serendipity of that discovery that's going to open up as a result of being able to access the things that currently are held locally rather than held through you um, is, is going to make the world a, a far more interesting place digitally. And, and, in, and smaller entities can, I mean, Amazon will not be, in, and, and Ozone won't carve up the world. And Until they start writing books. <laughs> Until they start, well, they do write books. They publish uh, books. Uh, write books. But, but uh, if, write them. But if people's social behaviors are any indication, Amazon in many instances is just as likely to get uh, you know, a positive interaction as a much smaller retailer. You know, it's, it's just as hard for big companies to garner positive attention as it is for small companies. And in many ways, it actually acts against you that you're that big because people are less inclined to interact with you because they feel like it's not a real person. So there's an interesting leveling out going on. I think the, the, you know, the small producer, the person that's doing something that no, nobody else is necessarily doing, um, that I think that they stand an even greater chance in the future of succeeding. One, one last question, Mel. Are you going to open any physical locations ever? Do you? We actually already have them. You have Oz stores? Ozone, Ozone has 2,200 what we call pickup points where people come and pick up their goods. That's, that's what Amazon announced, I think, a year or a year and a half ago. I think they're copying us. <laughs> 
on that cheerful note, we are out of time, kids. Um, one other thing, I forgot that I was going to do a commercial for Howard has a side business <laughs> that he is I, called Confide. Yes. Quick, one second. It's really interesting, and everybody should take a look at it. Go. It's an off-the-record messaging app that allows you to send self-destructing SMS. It's fantastic. You can. It's it's Snapchat for grown-ups. Snapchat for enterprise. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.